All right, we're going. I'll see you guys at Q&A then. All right, hey, um, excited to have everybody on. Hey, as everybody is filing in, what uh, I'd love for you to, if you've been on our webinars before, I always ask this at the very outset because it's always interesting to see who's attending and where they're calling in from. In previous webinars, we've had people calling in from all over the world. So if you would be so kind as to uh, go into the chat, put your uh, name, first name and where you're calling in from. So city or country, wherever it is from, go ahead and put it in there. Uh, Katie, if you don't mind go, uh, starting us off, but just go ahead and ho uh, to everybody, put your first name and where you're calling in from. So San Jose, absolutely, right down the street. Uh, Chicago, yeah, so love it. I used to live in Chicago, miss um, lots of things about Chicago. So, oh, Boston, oh, no, that's Katie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Singapore, fantastic. Love having everybody from all over the world, New Jersey, down the street, across the ocean, wherever you're at, we love having everybody, having everybody on. And so go ahead and keep posting, um, posting on, uh, on the chat uh, where, who you are and where you're calling in from. Uh, but we have today um, uh, Katie Congdon from, uh, from Northeastern University, and she is the uh, specifically the Northern California um, uh, admissions representative uh, for Northeastern. And so those of you who are like from Northern California, the Bay Area, I mean, Katie is definitely who you want to speak to. But for those of you who are not from there, she is still a fantastic resource and excited to have her on. And there's been so many, uh, so many changes and so many things happening. And uh, so why don't we go ahead and uh, just, just get started, shall we? All right, all right. Sounds, uh, sounds good. So why don't I give Katie an opportunity to introduce herself and perhaps share a little bit about how she got into admissions and uh, why don't you get, get us started? Awesome, thanks Elton. Um, like Elton mentioned, my name is Katie Congdon. I am currently one of the assistant directors of undergraduate admission at Northeastern University. If you are not familiar, Northeastern is located in the heart of downtown Boston. I've been here for almost six years now. Um, in the majority of those years, I've spent working out of the Northern California Territory. I am based here in Boston, but I focus primarily on the recruitment and um, application review of students specifically coming from Northern California. California, very familiar with the territory, with the schools, everything that goes on in Northern California. Um, I originally got into this field after being a first generation college student myself, meaning that neither one of my parents had previously gone to college. And so when it came time for me to apply, it was kind of just like teaching myself the process from A to Z. Um, I remember thinking um, how behind I felt how overwhelmed and daunting the process um, could feel and how I felt and I just thought that I didn't want any other students to ever feel that way. And so um, after graduating undergraduate, I decided to get my graduate program certificate or master's program, I should say, a master's degree in higher education. And I've been here ever since. I absolutely love it. And I am so thrilled to be here talking with you all tonight. Awesome, fantastic. Thanks for that, Katie. And one more thing, uh, that's those of you who know who have been a part of our uh, webinars. So go ahead and post questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. So go ahead and post it at any time. We're gonna come back at the very end and we'll answer all those questions. Anthony, as you all, all are familiar with, will come back on with us. We'll definitely sort through and make sure that we answer as many questions as we can. So go ahead and post those questions in the box at any time at the bottom. So, all right, so why don't we go ahead and get started? A lot of changes and certainly um, perhaps a large part of the past year was remote and there, I assume everybody, everything is transitioning back to in-person this coming year. What are some major changes that are gonna be happening for this coming year? Ooh, um, <laughs> Where to <that>. start? <laughs> Loaded question. Um, <laughs> Thinking back to where we were last year, it's definitely been a whirlwind of really the last year and a half. Um, 
the, we've had a few changes in the admissions process, um, mostly being test optional, which I'm sure we will talk loads about later on. Um, the physical differences around campus are pretty obvious as well. Um, for the coming fall, which is actually just in a few weeks, believe it or not, um, is coming very quickly. And it's looking a little more shall I say normal, um, as it did about a year and a half ago. Um, the majority of our students will be returning to campus, living on campus as well. We'll continue with the testing cadences we have in place. Um, we do have vaccinations that are both taking place on campus and something that is required for students, faculty, and staff. Um, Classes are back in person, which is really, really exciting, especially from the student affairs perspective. It's just good to have students learning from each other face to face. Um, really excited, but also kind of taking it one day at a time. Um, something I said from the very beginning, if there is any point in time to live, work and study at a tier one research university, it's during a global pandemic. I am <laughs> extremely happy and confident with how we've handled it so far and the plans of what how we're going to handle it moving ahead in the future. So very happy and excited for what's to come. That's awesome. Well, let's let's jump right in the test optional as yeah. you have so so uh, <laughs> eloquently inserted in there. So there's been certainly a lot of uh, like just like conjecture about how the lack of testing has has uh, has impacted the admissions process. There's been certainly a, a lot of things in the media that may imply that even though testing has been testing test scores submitting test scores is optional that there still seems like there's some benefit to submitting scores. And certainly like um, there are definitely uh, schools out there that that, you know, like Emory uh, University of Pennsylvania, that where there's the, the there's still a larger percentage of the admitted freshman class that had test scores and that didn't. So can you clear up maybe number, question number one is like, how did not having test scores change your guys's internal process? And is there really a benefit to submitting test scores, even though they're optional? Yes, let's just rip the bandaid right off. I love starting with this. <laughs> let's just let's do, do it. it. We're all thinking it, so might as well yeah, talk about it. We might as well. <laughs> um, I don't think a day goes by where I don't open my inbox to a question from a counselor, a parent, a student that says, but are you really test optional? Um, so I really am glad that you're bringing this up. Um, when we say test optional, I do want to start by saying we truly are test optional. Um, if you are choosing not to submit a test, my first thought would never be, oh, this kid is lazy. He just didn't want to find a testing center. That is not top of mind at all. With that being said, if a school is test optional like Northeastern and you are not a good test taker, this might be a really, really good year for you to spend your mental capacity doing something else and know that when we say test optional, we truly mean we're test optional. Um, looking back to last year, which was our first year being test optional, it was different, but it wasn't too, too different. And what I mean by that is that although we did require testing for students coming from domestic high schools, it wasn't required for students coming from international high schools. And so we already kind of had the taste of test optional within our admissions process. So it wasn't a huge life changing event like at maybe some other schools, but it definitely did take some getting used to. Um, what we ended up seeing last year was when you look at the entire admitted class who chose to then enroll at Northeastern, it's a pretty clear 50-50 split on both students that submitted testing and who chose not to submit testing. So I think that really speaks to the idea of truly being test optional. And even if you choose not to submit it, you will still be reviewed for admission to Northeastern, admission to our honors program, and for all merit scholarships. Now going into this next cycle, this will be our second year doing it. At this point in time, this is where kind of we meet the end of the road. Uh, we haven't made any final decisions for next, next cycle. So if you are a junior, Fingers crossed, we just don't know at this time right now, um, but for you rising seniors, we have 
officially made the made the call to be test optional. Um, same thing, you will still be reviewed for everything in the process. Nothing really changes either on your end or our end. Um, the next kind of follow up question I always get is, well, should I submit? Um, and that's really up to you. And I know that's probably not the answer that you want to hear from an admissions rep. But I think there's a few things to consider once you get your test score back and you open that email to see your test score, I think if it, you go, oh, nice, <laughs> nice job, you know, pat on the back, that's probably a good idea to submit it. If you kind of go, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe I should have tried harder, maybe I should have done this or that, probably a telltale sign that you shouldn't submit it. Um, I think if you look at your overall GPA in whatever high school you're coming from, because we see students from all over the world, if you're looking at your GPA and you are top of the class, but yet you take a test and you're not top percentile, it's probably good for us just to stick with that GPA and not even see your test scores. So again, we truly, truly are test optional, but if you can, um, safely take a test and you want to take a test and you end up getting that score, think about how it makes you feel and then decide if you want to send it in. So perhaps maybe as a follow up to that, and because I've heard this come up in other conversations and certainly we've talked about it as well, uh, there is data out there. So there is an average perhaps entry um, SAT or ACT score that's out there on a national level. And some high schools have access to Naviance or SCORE or some other kind of platform that helps them see the average entry test score for students from their high school. Now, how would you, like, is there any wisdom to say comparing your score to those numbers and making a decision based on what is submitted by that? Kind of. And again, probably not <laughs> fair, the answer. <laughs> probably not response. the answer students are looking for. Um, so when I say kind of, there's a few things we have in mind. So the numbers that you're going to find on Naviance, on Google, Reddit, um, College Confidential, whatever you're finding out in the the dark web, those numbers keep in mind are going to be from two years ago, and the numbers that we saw last year, I don't think are really a good representation because you have to remember that only half of the population took the tests. And for some reason, we had a lot of students submitting tests that were way under our averages. But I think last year, it was just a whole lot of unknown that even though I know I didn't do well on the test, I just want to show you that I took the test. So I'm going to submit it anyways. So even if you find numbers, they may not be kind of where we're looking. Um, so again, I think using your GPA at your high school is probably going to be the best indicator. If you're top 25% at your high school and your SAT or ACT score is not top 25 percentile, it's probably not going to add up on our end. It might look a little funky. Promise you that we're only looking at really the best one here. So I would recommend sticking with that GPA, put your mental capacity elsewhere and take it from there. Um, if you do find numbers though, because I'm sure a lot of you are feverishly Googling something on the side right now, um, what I can tell you from, again, this is two years ago. So stats from two years ago. For SAT, we saw anywhere between 1450 and 1550. Again, 1600 is the highest, so it's pretty high up there. And then ACT was falling anywhere between 34 and 35 out of 36 potential points. So a lot to think about, take it with a grain of salt, but really um, stick with whatever feels comfortable for you. Got it, got it. And certainly uh, you you alluded to, and let me make sure I clarify, I'm not sure if I heard it correctly, mm -hmm. but you said on the fresh, the admitted freshman class was 50-50 or the applicant pool was 50-50? The admitted class. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is, I mean, I would say I agree. That is a testimony that, you know, like, like having test scores. Yeah, I agree with it. That, that that that's a good, that's that's a, definitely a good statement. So, with that being said, certainly, and this is a question that seems to come up often as well. If I don't submit test scores, are you spending more time looking at other things, whether it's my resume, whether it's my grades, or perhaps rig or course rigor? Like, are you shifting that attention somewhere else on the application? 
Ultimately, yes. Um, I do have to say, even if your test scores were in front of me, I would look at them and then move on to something else. So we're not talking about a whole lot of time that I can now dedicate to your beautifully written essay. Um, but at least it it kind of helps in the sense, maybe for um, you being the students, it might help know that um, we really are looking at all pieces of your application. This is what we call holistic review. I think it's a buzzword in higher ed these days. Um, but we truly are looking at all other pieces of your application. Got it, got it. So you're just perhaps redistributing that attention to all the other parts and, and spending more time. Okay, got it. So let me um, let me come back away from that. We'll probably address that more in the, in the Q&A, but uh, let's talk a little bit about Northeastern. What makes Northeastern unique? And uh, interestingly, like those of you who are on the, on, the, uh, on the webinar, we had a student panel from Northeastern come on with us a couple of weeks ago. And they just glowed about their student experience. And they talked a lot about the co-op, about the international experience. And those seem like very unique uh, opportunities for Northeastern. So, so if you don't mind, share a, a little bit about what makes Northeastern different from everywhere else. Sure. Another loaded question. <laughs> um, I, I think <laughs> there's probably three aspects of Northeastern that make us really unique. Um, the three I'm thinking of are um, location, academics, and experiential learning. So um, I'll start with location. Um, like I said, we are located in the heart of downtown Boston, but that is not it. That's not where we end our reach. Um, we truly are a global university, meaning that we now have 12 regional campuses all over the world. This is not a sister or a partner school. This is truly a little Northeastern dropped in the middle of somewhere else. Um, somewhere that is um, familiar to all of you. We have some in um, San Jose, uh, San Francisco. We have one in Seattle. Um, and we just now um, recently acquired Mills College in Oakland. So those are the ones that are kind of closest to all of you on the West Coast. Um, but like I said, all of them are sprinkled throughout the world. Um, two on other countries include um, um, we have recently acquired um, New College of the Humanities in London, England, and then mm. we have a few locations now, two in um, Toronto and Vancouver. So um, again, these are Northeastern University locations in other areas of the world. So for you as students, it allows you to study in another area. Um, if you wanted to, I know I'm going to talk about in just a second doing co-op, um, really making those connections and networking in those areas as well is really important. Um, that second aspect that I think is really unique is academics. And I say this because we offer now over 250 different majors, which you don't typically find at a lot of other schools and universities of our size. And so again, this allows for a lot of flexibility. It allows for the natural ability to um, maybe take a combined major. So combining different areas, taking courses across different colleges, really making a um, multi-dimensional graduate out of yourself. So really something to think about. And that third, but definitely last but not least opportunity here is gonna be experiential learning, which does include co-op um, like Elton mentioned. And the idea about co-op, if you aren't familiar, is that it's a six month long full-time work experience. So students are actually able to step away from their classes, take a pause or a break in their academics and truly take what they're learning in the class classroom to apply that to real world contexts. So these are full time job opportunities. We currently work with 3400 co op employers worldwide, including all seven continents. If you want to study or do something in Antarctica, this is probably the time to do it. I don't you know have a, you have a partner life. in Antarctica. Yeah, oh, I don't know when else you do it. So I always recommend students to do that co-op. Um, if you are interested, it's a research focused co-op where you'll be living on a research ship for six months. Every um, co-op cycle, they try to switch up the project they're working on. Um, so right now they are working with robotic animals that they send down to the marine life so that people like us don't have to go down there. It sounds pretty chilly. So um, such a cool way to study, to learn, uh, uh, learn and live down there. Um, so great opportunities. Like I said, this is a full-time job experience. So definitely a lot different than the traditional internship. And students can do up to three of them while you're here. So that's a total of 18 months of full-time work experience. I really don't know many other schools that allow you to do that many experiences before graduating college. So it's pretty unique in my my perspective 
And no question. And I, I don't want to differentiate because I, I think this is really the hallmark of Northeastern is the co-op mm -hmm. program and what, you know, you are trying to delineate what makes it different than an internship. Certainly students, we have students at all sorts of different colleges and over the summer mm -hmm. they're vying for different internships. But specifically with Northeastern, you have, uh, are, are, is, it, is it safe to say that you have partnerships with these 3,400 corporate, corporate entities and these students get are they are students basically pipelined into these internships or like how does the process work for 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 the co-op yeah absolutely so these are um tried and true partnerships um every six months it's almost like the company or organization has one full-time position or multiple if they want multiple but they have one full-time position and every six months a new northeastern student rotates in and out of that role mm -hmm. and so um you're not competing against other college students this is only offered at northeastern um you're not competing with graduate students again this is an undergraduate northeastern program. Um, so really cool opportunity there. Many of our partners come back year after year, sometimes asking for more and more co-ops. So it's a wonderful way to um, not only network, but really get to know what types of jobs are out there, what interests you, sometimes years before graduation. Um, I myself went to a school just being totally open and transparent. It was not Northeastern, but I went to a school that didn't offer these co-ops. And I actually went to school for accounting because I thought that's what I wanted to do. Um, day two on the job, absolutely hated it. Um, so it was a tough conversation to have with my parents for sure. Um, so I always like to stress and emphasize that this co-op allows you to really try out a career so far ahead of graduation that by the time you graduate, not only are you looking at jobs that are no longer entry level, these are assistant director, managerial, supervisor, whatever that's gonna look like, but um, chances are the pay is high Higher because again, these aren't entry level jobs. And so a great way to really culminate your undergraduate experience is to get that job. And many of our students do graduate with offers from our co-op partners. Yeah, and I think that's the key thing right there, which is like um, having a student go in and do a full-time internship for an entire semester or longer um, yeah. sets up their resume in a very strong way. And in most cases, I mean, if you're working with a particular employer, there's a high, I mean, there's a good chance that you'll end up getting hired back from that employer and uh, and thereby um, students from Northeastern, like you're building into the entire undergraduate process, um, like pre-professional training and then helping them launch them into the career, which also, I mean, I, I believe like Northeastern's hire rate out, out of college is something like 98% or 99% or something like that. That's correct. Within the first six months after graduation. Correct, mm -hmm. correct, correct. So that's that's outstanding and uh, and actually vastly different than a lot of other schools. So I think that's definitely most certainly a hallmark. Um, why don't we uh, with that? I think with this with this emphasis on um, providing a, like job experience and really training students and helping them understand which careers are the best. Um, that would make it seem like Northeastern may not be as research oriented. And certainly there are students here who are wanting to go pre-med or engineer in computer science and wanting to get involved in research as a high priority. How is that being expressed on, on, at Northeastern? Yeah, uh, you know, it's hard with such robust opportunities, both in co-op and research. We usually find ourselves talking about one and not the other. Um, but luckily, I have the opportunity now to talk about both. Um, research is huge here. And it's actually really big for students, believe it or not, who aren't in the STEM fields as well. So if you're looking at humanities, business, um, even in the arts, we have lots of research opportunities. Um, we are a tier one research university, which is really just a fancy term for saying that we have some of the highest level of research currently taking place on our campus. Um, not just, again, in that STEM fields, but all over. We have a brand new building that just went up on campus um, two years ago now, um, right before COVID. It opened and then it had to shut down again. But wonderful building that um, incorporates all interdisciplinary research, meaning if you walk around this building, the plaques on the doors of all of the labs have kind of a little um, 
a blurb about what they're working on in the lab. And it, I just love walking around and reading it because it's a lot of things that you would never think of combining. Um, thinking about like political science and statistics. Um, we talk about cybersecurity and business. So um, really interdisciplinary in nature is kind of what we cater to. Um, a second part of research that I really love here is that in our labs, we have spaces for both our undergraduate students in additional spaces for graduate and post-grad students. So I think this is a um, pretty unique factor in the sense that you're not competing with students who have six plus years of experience and research ahead of you. There are always opportunities for students in undergraduate positions to take places in labs. Um, I know you mentioned pre-med. Uh, pre I do wanna talk about pre-med advising real quick. We have a pretty um, extensive program for pre-med advising. The same goes for pre-dental pre-vet and pre-law. Um, you don't need to apply into these programs. Once you're admitted and choose to enroll at Northeastern, you then partner with both your academic advisor in whichever major you choose, in addition to a pre X advisor, again, law, dental, vet, or medical. Um, and they're gonna help you through the entire process throughout your next four or five years in an undergraduate career to help you then get to that next step. In the pre-med advising specifically, many of these advisors, if not all of them, I need to go back and check, but many of them have had experience in medical school application process in that admissions committee. And so they truly know what they're looking for. There's no better resource out there to really help you get to medical school if it's something you want to do. And studying in Boston is where it's at. We are truly the hub of healthcare. You have some of the nation's top hospitals within walking distance of our campus. This is the place to be if pre-med is something you're even considering. <laughs> That's certainly a, a hearty endorsement definitely for pre-med students. And I'm, I'm sure there are definitely some uh, in the audience. So fantastic. So let me um, let me come back and talk a little bit about international programs, because that's also pretty unique for Northeastern. And let me also remind you, if you have questions that you want to ask Katie, we're going to get to questions pretty soon. So go ahead and post them in the Q&A box. And as uh, Anthony will come back and, and we'll, we'll tackle them. So go ahead and keep posting. But um, I, I feel like I want to ask this question in part because I feel like we're going to get this question, you know, like six months from now. And I want to direct somebody to watch this webinar and then kind of hear what you're saying. But um, Northeastern has offered a lot of incoming students that initial international experience. So basically, uh, maybe as a, as a summary, just studying abroad for a term uh, before you actually come back and study back at Northeastern. And there's a lot of families who feel a little bit sort of unnerved by that. Like is what, what's Northeastern doing? Are they pushing off my student to like somewhere else before they, they come back? But what are, what are, what can you tell us a little bit about the international program, how that fits into the admission process, and what are some of the benefits for having having it that way? Yes, absolutely. So um, some of the international experiences that um, Elton is talking about primarily is called NUIN, which stands for Northeastern University International. And it's an opportunity that if students are selected through our admissions process, they are invited to start at one of our, in, in pre-COVID years, um, we <laughs> originally had seven to nine locations. In our post-COVID years, it's closer to four to five locations. So um, I do have to watch the language there sometimes, but they do get an array of locations to choose from. And um, just like he mentioned, these students would start overseas for their first semester. Um, typically, we have about a third of our entire entering class that starts overseas. And this program was founded over 10 years ago as a way for us to admit more um, admissible students, just because we don't have the bed space at Northeastern, we didn't want to limit ourselves here. So um, opening up different campuses, again, these are all partnerships, and most of them have been with us since we opened this program. So um, thinking about the um, American College in Thessaloniki in Greece, um, we have the um, we have UCD in Dublin, Ireland. Um, we have a program now at our newly acquired um, campus in London. Um, Rome, we usually have a program as well. So um, those are kind of the four go-to locations that have been with us since the beginning, and I don't see them going away anytime soon. Um, like I mentioned, students would be abroad for that 
first semester, so anywhere between three, three and a half months. Once that complete, they'll then return back to campus in Boston and join the rest of their peers here. Um, I totally resonate with the thought of um, why was I selected? How am I gonna fit in when I come back? There's a lot of hesitations that typically do come up quite naturally when students, um, if they're getting this type of admissions decision. And um, I'm quite a data statistics nerd myself. So I always like to go back and look at kind of how students um, started um, both in Boston and overseas, um, how they're faring now. And it's really, really interesting to see that not only are these students, again, according to the stats, not only are they more involved outside of the classroom, but they're more academically prepared for when they do return here in Boston. So um, I think it's a big learning opportunity. It's great for students who um, really wanna step outside their comfort zone, step outside those boundaries. Um, a lot of maturity takes place in that first semester. And again, I just wanna reemphasize, it's just one semester. So the return in the spring and join the rest of their peers then. Got it, got it. And, and for those of you who, have been following our webinars. We definitely we interviewed a uh, a group of Northeastern students, and all four of them, all four, all three of them, uh, did were admitted on the uh, NUN and did oh, wow. the first semester abroad. Uh, all three of them did it in Greece uh, mm -hmm. at the American School, and they found it to be one of the most enriching experiences. And, and really, like it really bonded that group of students together as they came on the campus. And uh, it was just a, like they were glowing about the experience. So I think this is where, as we see more of our students who are going on the program um, and, you know, uh, you know, we're able to sort of come back and feel way more confident about saying, hey, NU has really, um, you know, uh, done a good job with this international program that's really going to benefit the students. So that's great to hear. Um, all right, last thing, because I feel like before we get to questions, go ahead and post your questions. Uh, and if you're asking questions about essays and stuff like that, uh, you can actually ask on the Q&A or you can watch last year's webinar, which I think Katie, Katie answered really well. But maybe with regards to the, the last thing about the admissions process is what, what kind of applicant are you looking for? Like what is the, what is the student that really thrives at Northeastern? Million dollar question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, we've talked a lot tonight about the unique factors of Northeastern. So I think the student that's going to thrive the most is aware of those unique factors and mm. open to trying new things. Um, this is probably not the college for you if you're looking to um, maybe at orienta orientation, you're going to meet your BFF and spend every waking hour with them for the next four years. It doesn't really work like that. Um, the students here, because of co op, because of travel abroad, they're always coming and going. Um, you might have your friends leave for a semester, then come back, then you'll leave, then come back. And so the students here really adapt to that pretty quickly um, in the sense that you're going to find a lot more mature students that are here, students that are more open to meeting new friends and sharing ideas. Um, at dinner time around the cafeteria, you're going to find students on Monday nights sitting together and then Tuesday nights, they could be sitting with someone else. It just depends on where students are at. So um, really just understanding how we're different, why we're different and embracing that. Um, the best way to kind of convey that in that application, if you're looking for ways to show that is um, looking at past experiential learning opportunities. Have you held a job? Have you had an internship? Um, have you really enjoyed that kind of hands-on experience? Um, things like research, we talk about community service. Um, those are really big aspects of our experiential learning um, component um, make up the program here. So if you've done that in the past, we assume that you would be open and willing to continue that in the future here, but um, really looking for students who are really ultimately trying to think outside of the box and do something a little more creative during their undergraduate experience. Uh, I lied. I have one more question before we go okay. into Q&A. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about early decision. Now, I, I, if I remember correctly, I saw some stats maybe four or five years ago where uh, the ED admit rate into Northeastern was not much different than the regular admission admit rate. But my sense is that that may have changed. And is there genuine benefit to applying early decision if Northeastern relays your top rate? You're a very smart man. Yes, huh. that has changed a little bit. You are um, spot on with that. Um, I'll start with the benefits first. Mm -hmm. um, so as of last year, we made it 
pretty known that we were trying to admit a bigger majority of our class through the early decision um, process. And if you aren't familiar, just very quickly, this is that binding process, a little different than early action or regular, meaning students who apply our ED, they are saying, I really want to go to Northeastern. I'm already bleeding black and gold. I really just, I need to get here. Um, so thinking about that is important. Um, but the way that it works here is that um, last year, as we all know, um, was a very unknown year. And um, we used early decision as a way to fill our class earlier on in the cycle than we had in years past. Um, so as I mentioned before, some of the benefits as of last year um, was that um, mainly in financial aid, we were allowing students to submit their documents earlier than before. We were then having a turnaround time faster than before, uh, meaning that we were going to review your financial aid documents earlier to tell you right away if this is a good financial fit. Um, we had some academic benefits, meaning that we were able to open some of our summer programming that's now taking place during this summer for last year's class. Um, this is some opportunities for students to bulk up on courses on the front end so that they can allow for more co-ops, travel abroad, research, whatever it may be later on in their undergraduate career. Um, and then we also had some scholarships available as well. Those primarily went towards those summer classes, um, assuming that students successfully completed them, enrolled on time, all those, um, you know, matriculation kind of things that we stick students to, as long as they were doing that, we were able to waive that fee and give them that scholarship for those. So um, there were some benefits. It's hard to say if those are going to last this year, next year, any future years. Um, but I think just applying ED in general, if this truly is a good fit, a social fit, an academic fit, and a financial fit, I think it's a really kind of viable option for you if you are thinking of Northeastern applying ED. I think that in a world of test optional as well, it's really important for students who maybe feel that they are um, just under the threshold of where we would normally admit students in a non-binding application, again, being early action or regular decision. Um, really showing that commitment for ED will and, and likely will have a impact on your admissions decision. We did see about 40% of our class this year enrolling through either ED1 or ED2. Mm, got it, got it. So what you're saying is that like there was a commitment by the university to, you know, uh, increase to a degree the mm -hmm. uh, freshman class on ED and in large part uh, in, in response to the pandemic. Would you say that that's also going to happen this coming year as well? I wouldn't be shocked if it if it um, was any different. Um, uh -huh. Again, it, it's just a year of unknowns. Yeah. Um, and, and I could talk all night about enrollment management and the tools and <laughs> tips and tricks and everything that goes on. But um, I think for, for us, um, we are ultimately trying to build that next entering class. And so mm -hmm. having a small group of students that say, pick me, I'm really committed, it makes mm -hmm. it easy for us. And so I do definitely see us using this model again in the future. Got it, got it. We need to have another hour of enrollment management uh, yes. conversation. <laughs> it's exciting stuff. Okay, so I'm going to invite Anthony to come back on and we'll go through some of the questions. So go ahead and keep posting questions. And uh, in the Q&A, if there's anything that Katie mentioned during our talk, uh, feel free. Everything is fair game. Or if there's something that she didn't mention that you wanted her to mention, mm -hmm. you know, go ahead and post it up there too. So uh, Anthony? Perfect. Yeah, I'll kind of go back and I'm going to try to group these together if I can, but you know, there are just questions about everything. So let's start with test optional since there are a lot of kind of questions related to there. Um, questions regarding, hey, um, test optional, this question of is test optional really test optional, but they're also asking, is there any other supplemental things that they can apply with that would be helpful, whether it's AP scores or other additional information? Um, does any of that help in consideration that it's already test optional to begin with. Sure. So um, we try to keep this as easy as possible for you and mostly for us. Um, we don't have a supplemental essay. However, that has never stopped students before. If you have something in addition that you want us to read or consider, you're always welcome to submit that um, within reason. You know, we've had those 13 extra recommendation letters. We've had 20 other essays. That's not worth it. But if there's something really that you think is missing from your application, please feel free to submit that. Um, talking about AP scores. So these actually don't impact your your admissions decision. However, if you do choose to enroll after being admitted, they can help kind of um, 
supplement you for um, course credit. So if you score a four or a five, you can test out of some classes here. So I want, I want, I want to make that clear because I, I think there's been some confusion in part because there's no longer SAT subject tests. Some universities were considering those and perhaps saying that they were going to shift some of that attention to AP scores. But are you saying that AP scores are not a part of the application rubric, admission rubric? Correct. Not okay. for this year and moving forward. Yep. I got it. Uh, note to students and parents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, questions about co-ops also, because I think there's also just some uh, confusion here asking like, hey, does a co-op program lengthen my graduation time? Uh, or, you know, how does that affect the timing of everything as it, since it's integrated within the school year? Yeah, that's a really great question and a very common question as well. So um, like I said, these are six months in duration. One of these co-ops is already integrated into your coursework. So if you do one co-op, you can still graduate in four years. When you do two co-ops, you're looking at between four, four and a half years. Three co-ops, that's when you start looking at five years. So if you ever hear someone say, I'm on the four or five year plan, it's really just based on their co-ops. Something I really want to mention here is that even though it might take you five years to graduate, you are never paying for five years worth of tuition. You only pay for the time that you're in the classroom, which for every student is going to be eight in-class semesters or four years. And then, of course, when the co-op, you're probably making some money as well, right? You sure are. <laughs> and some, oh my gosh, some of these hourly rates are maybe a little more than I make. So these students are not uh, in any disadvantage whatsoever. <laughs> you're going to be applying for a co-op. Right? Yeah, so. probably. <laughs> <laughs> and also a question about, yeah, they're saying like, okay, you know, computer science, engineering, I kind of understand like what those co-ops would look like. I think they were asking questions about uh, what psychology uh, majors kind of go into, or maybe kind of these other programs as well, since you were emphasizing like, hey, we've also got uh, something in Antarctica. So I guess they also want to hear a couple other examples or what that looks like for uh, students. Yeah. Um, so you probably wouldn't do a psychology co-op in Antarctica, unfortunately. However, <laughs> um, we work with government agencies, schools, hospitals, healthcare clinics, um, nonprofits, um, startups, you name it, anything. Um, a lot in the Boston area. So um, if you're looking at psychology, criminal justice, anything in the humanities, really, um, we work a lot with the local um, city governments or city um, agencies, I should say. Um, we work a Boston Police Department, Boston Fire Department, um, a lot of the local sports teams. We have some um, sports analytical students working with um, the NHL or the Boston Bruins. Um, so you name it. I mean, really, there's just a little bit of everything here. Do you need to be that particular major in order to do the co-op in that area? So if you're a psych major, can you do a CS co-op? For your first co-op, um, it is requested by co-op advisors that it is done in your major of choice. After mm -hmm. that, you get a pretty good idea of, is this a good major for me still, or should I change academic mm -hmm. paths? Where am I headed next? Um, by that point, if students decide, they can choose to stay in that same path. Um, a lot of times students will stay at the same companies too, just maybe work their way up the ladder through these co-op experiences. Um, in other reasons, um, there are students that completely hate their first co-op and that's fine too. Um, thinking back to my college days, I probably would have done my first co-op in accounting, found out right then and there that it wasn't for me and I still would have had two years to change paths. So I think it's a great way ultimately to kind of try out a career. There's lots of room for flexibility afterwards. And then also just questions about, I think the other thing to highlight is the combined programs at uh, you know, Northeastern. So questions about related to business and computer science or what's the flexibility like there with the combined programs? Yeah, some of these interest me so much too, especially the biology and political science ones. You think how in the world are they connected? What are those classes like? Um, I think it's so interesting. So all of these, so there's 175 combined majors and they've all been previously selected by students themselves. Um, students have found kind of something we're missing in the classroom, a connection that we're not making. And so they work closely with their advisors to create that combined major program. Um, a lot of these, if you're looking online, you're going to notice that a lot of them are interdisciplinary in nature, meaning that they're not all in one college, they're going to be across colleges. Um, computer science and X, 
seems to be really, really popular these days. As you can imagine, you can combine that with just about anything. Um, think about any job you can have today. There's always some type of tech component in that. Um, so I think getting started early on that is again, gonna lead to that multi-dimensional graduate that I talked about earlier. And also a question regarding the co-op program again, just to reiterate, but I think it was, it was that uh, every student is doing one co-op at least, and then can do uh, a second or a third based on their choosing, right? So basically, effectively, the question was, what percentage of STEM students enter a co-op program? The question, it's effectively all of them, right? Just about, yeah. Um, believe it or not, we have 98% of students who will do at least one of them. Um, there, in every program, academic program that you choose, there's always room for at least one co-op. Thinking about um, like pharmacy, for example, might not have more than that, just because that program is already so um, structured as it is. But no matter what, all programs do al allow for at least one of them. And then a question about when they're applying to Northeastern, do you apply for a particular college? Do you apply for a particular campus, such as the uh, NUN uh, particular uh, option as well? Uh, what does that look like from an applicant's perspective? Sure. So from a student's perspective, oh my gosh, it's been a long day. Um, one of the final questions on the application is going to ask you to indicate your major of interest. And that's all we ask. We'll do the rest of that background work to see exactly where you're going to fit best, um, whether it's at a different location through that NUN program um, or whatever it may be. Um, at this time, we do only allow students to select one major. Assuming you're admitted, you would be admitted directly into that major major that was previously selected, but please know that it can change at any point in time. And about 90% of students will change their major at least once on campus. So very popular, very easy, very flexible to change. Uh, and also a question about like how many students do end up uh, going into that NUN uh, program. I think it's just a question of like just how large that program is in comparison to students that choose to just start their uh, you know, college experience in Boston. Yep, so it's about a third of our class. So in total, it's anywhere between 1,300 and 1,500 students, depending on the class size of that year. Let's see. Uh, a question about sports at Northeastern. So I think it's also uh, saying like uh, student involvement in athletics or uh, perhaps also school spirit related to that. Uh, could you emphasize a little bit of that? Yeah, we are a huge sports school. Um, just because we're based in the Northeast, Boston, I think is just huge on sports, regardless of um, if you wanna follow Northeastern or just Boston sports in general. Um, hockey is definitely gonna be our biggest sport. We do not have football. It's kind of a fun fact. We're not one of those schools with football, but hockey is like our football. Um, everyone comes out of the, the campus woodwork and, and starts to really um, cheer on the teams, both men's and women's. Um, um, basketball and rowing follow that. Um, but if you're interested in playing D1, Division One, we do have that on campus. We also have club and intramural sports as well. Um, the questions keep coming in, so I'm always looking at the new ones. Um, but I want to ask about also like entrepreneurship. Uh, I guess the question was about like, hey, what entrepreneurship experiences are you looking at in your applicants, right? Uh, but I guess also want to give you the chance to emphasize like any of the business programs on campus as well uh, and what's available to students. Sure. So I'll start with that first one. I don't think there's any any really anything that we're specifically looking at in an application. And if they don't have it, we just skip it and move on to the next one. Um, so I'm not expecting anyone to have entrepreneurial background, um, but if you do have it, that's great. Um, more the merrier. We'd love to read all about it. Um, could be in the activity sheet, could be an additional resume. Feel free to submit that. Um, I can talk a little bit more about what we offer here. Um, the biggest option is called IDEA. IDEA, and it's our own student-led venture capital. So um, a way for students to create these businesses, and many of them have been created um, that are now in local businesses or being sold elsewhere um, that have started right on our campus. Um, Handlebar, one of the um, 
um, cycling places in Boston that was started on our campus. There is a small breakfast bar that the name of it is actually slipping my mind, but it's a breakfast bar that you can grab and eat on the go. And it's supposed to include both your daily breakfast and your daily um, caffeine intake. I haven't tried it yet. I still can't get over the fact of like drinking a coffee in a bar. Like I just don't get that, but still really cool. Currently sold in places like Whole Foods, Wegmans, Trader Joe's. So um, started right on our campus. Again, what I think is so unique is that it's completely student led. It is funded by external funders that come in every year. And so um, a great way to be involved in that, whether if you're at the leadership role, or if you really just want to get started and help out in any way possible. It's a wonderful opportunity to get involved. Some, that's some generous donors that just put a pile of money for the students to say, hey, you guys go yes. figure out what to do with it. So yes. <laughs> Um, well, I'm wondering, about, I'm wondering okay. Anthony, like just, just in case you're not clear on the AB 104. So there is a, are you familiar with that, Katie? The uh, Cal California, there's a, there's a, there's a bill um, that's, that was passed uh, called AB 104 that allows students to change their grades to pass, no pass. Uh, and as a reflection of, you know, like it's been a difficult, you know, season with pandemic and remote school. And yeah. students have the option to uh, to change a D or an F to either a pass or pass. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think there was a question on what sort of impact that might be, because certainly, you know, you might see a transcript that has a bunch of grades and then there's a pass. And what, how might you interpret that and what might be the impact on the uh, review? Sure. So I think this follows the um, the test optional route in the sense that if I were to see that, my first assumption is not going straight to, wow, this kid must have failed. He's just trying to hide something. Or she, I wouldn't, you know, mention that. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it would really impact it much at all. Um, I would say with our pass fail classes, they are not calculated into your GPA when we, we recalculate it on our end. So it is something to think about if you were getting an A and a B and for whatever reason you want to change it to a pass or fail, know that it wouldn't be calculated. Um, I think that if you were not favorably passing the class, it might not be a bad idea to do pass fail. Um, but I would like to know a little bit more about why you chose it. Um, I always like to hear about students academic experiences, even if you didn't pass the class with flying colors. What happened? What did you learn? Um, how are you going to do it in differently in the future? And so that's always important to include in your application, because if we don't get that from you, there's a lot of questions that we may have in our head as we're reading the applications. And with 75,000 plus of them, there's possibly not enough time the day to reach out to every student to ask for further clarification. So I always like to say provide us more information than not enough information. Um, let's see, a question also, this is a funny question, but asking about how large the cohorts are in the uh, NUN programs. They're saying, hey, is it possible that I end up being the only North, Northeastern student uh, at this particular campus or at this particular location? Fair if question. That if that were the case, then we really messed up. Um, no, students would never be alone. The smallest cohort is usually around 75 students, the largest being around 300. So um, another kind of plus side to this is that you now have the chance to build um, stronger relationships with a smaller amount of students versus if you were to come to campus in Boston for your first semester, you're going to make more loose relationships with more students. So you're not really finding the connections as easily as you would at something like NUN. I love all the interest in this, though. I, I really appreciate the questions coming in. Happy to answer more about this either tonight or offline, but I really love all the interest in NUN. Uh, Basically, final call for questions. I've got three left that we can cover, uh, but of course, anyone else want to quickly try to slip one in, definitely submit it. Um, question about, hey, any programs about women leadership or something like that uh, that's available on campus? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, we have two minors right now, one in leadership, one in women and gender studies. So. Um, 
it's never stopped anyone before to do two minors. So if you're interested, you can always do that. Um, outside of the classroom as well, we have a few student affinity groups um, that focus on um, helping students who um, identify with female genders to then make their way up, whether it's leadership, um, different organizations, um, networking opportunities with local companies. So um, highly recommend you to get involved in those. And then a question about, I think you mentioned that international applicants prior did not have to submit test scores. Uh, I think it's just a continued question thinking about like, how else is the process different from uh, for international applicants to uh, compare to domestic applicants? Sure. Um, two other major differences. Um, one is going to be around English language learning. Um, so students who have selected English not being their first language, and they have less than four years consecutive um, time in an English speaking classroom, then we are going to require them to submit English proficiency. This typically comes out in like a TOEFL or an IELTS test. So that would be required at that point. Um, the second biggest difference is in, in regards to financial financial aid. So right now, I know it's not a favorable answer, but right now we can't award federal funding to students who don't have a social security card or green card in their possession. Um, if this changes, you can always apply for federal financial aid afterwards, but beforehand we can't award that. However, I always like to mention that all students, regardless of their citizenship, are reviewed for merit-based scholarships. So um, don't think that there's no chance that you're getting um, federal uh, financial help. You can't always get that in a merit-based scholarship. And then last question also about, uh, uh, I think when you mentioned the GPA recalculation, they're also wondering like how are APs, honors classes calculated or how do you weight those? Yeah, and that was something as soon as or I said it, it, I knew I'd probably open up a can of worms with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's generally, a secret. <laughs> Yeah, generally speaking, um, it's actually a computer that does it for us. So I don't have an exact calculation of how everything's done, but I can tell you generally speaking, the more honors and um, AP IB courses, if offered at your high school, um, more of those courses you're taking, the higher your GPA is gonna be. So for AP and IB courses, you are awarded one full GPA point. For honors, that's half a point. Um, so typically this is gonna be looking on a five point scale. So students coming in with GPAs of 4.5 might look a little shocking to you, but really that's pretty average on our end. So um, know that they're going to be a little higher than what they probably are right now at your high school. One more question. Oh, I asked Katie, what's the best way to reach you for further discussion? Oh, perfect. Let me see if I can put that in the chat box. Just throw in my email there. Um, like we mentioned in the beginning, I am the uh, representative for the Northern California Territory, but I'm more than happy to help answer any questions otherwise. And then I can um, just kind of forward your email along to another colleague, make that introduction for you if there is someone in our office that deals more specifically with the high school that you're coming from. Katie, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to do this conversation again, and also to see how, like, I mean, how Northeastern has navigated the last year. And it's uh, exciting that everybody is going to be back on campus this coming fall. So excited for you, and also want to say congratulations. I know that you are <laughs> uh, expecting, so excited for that as well. So. Um, again, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. You've been a wealth of, uh, of information and resource. So thank you. And if you, Katie's email is at the bottom. So go ahead and uh, please reach out to her if necessary. And uh, thanks everyone again. Uh, when's our next uh, webinar, Anthony? I have to check the schedule. <laughs> yeah. I Everybody, honestly do not know. I'll have to check the schedule, the email. but I'll keep you follow all updated. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look out for the emails. There's something coming up next. I think uh, Johns Hopkins student panel perhaps coming. There's some things coming. So look out for it. But thank you so much, Katie. Really appreciate having you on again. And, uh, and have a good fall. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Bye. Take care. Thanks so much, Katie. All right. Bye. Bye.